Morning, church. Children, ages four through kindergarten, you can be dismissed to Children's Church at this time with Miss Cammie back there. Everyone else, we are going to be in Genesis chapter 4 today. So if you turn in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 4. Is this the one? Is the question that gets asked an awful lot. Just about anything you shop for, you ask that question. Is this the one? Is this the right car for me? Is this the right house for me? Men and women, as you, as you date, you ask yourself, is this the one? Is this the person I'm going to spend the rest of my life with? Men, when you buy the ring, you ask, is this the one, the right ring for, for my fiance? Women, as you pick out your dress, is this the one that I'm going to say yes to? And it's not a bad question to ask at all. You want what's right for you, right? So we ask that question, is this the one? But do you ever go into that? Do you ever ask that question probably with too high of expectations? A while back, we were looking to upgrade our vehicle. It was a few years ago. We had this little Ford Flex. Um, I hated that car. <laughs> the six of us would cram into it. Um, it didn't run well, didn't drive well. We spent a lot of money trying to fix it up again and again and again. And the last time it went into the shop, uh, it was going to cost thousands of dollars. I thought that's more than what the car is worth. So we decided you can have it. We'll look for something else. We were going to upgrade. And so we start making this list, Cami and I, and we started our list by all the things we didn't like about the Flex, about the Ford Flex. And we went from there. And basically, the, this vehicle that we had in mind that we wanted to purchase, uh, you know, is something that had to fit all six of us very comfortably, something that had enough trunk space for all of our luggage when we traveled down to go see family, uh, something at the very least had to have all-wheel drive, something that can haul a trailer if need be. I don't own a trailer, but maybe someday, right? Um, something that was decent on gas, want Bluetooth, want navigation, something that doesn't have a lot of miles that's in great shape and that isn't going to cost an arm and a leg, and something we won't resent after a year of owning. And I'm going to tell you something, that vehicle does not exist. <laughs> it doesn't exist. Anything with a third row and luggage space and that doesn't have a lot of miles is not inexpensive at all. So already we run into this problem. Our, our expectations are so unrealistic. And, and here's this other problem. My the one does not line up with Cammy's the one. And so when I plug in my qualifications for what I want in this vehicle, I'm thinking SUV, right? A Suburban or something. And Cammy is thinking of van. And I hate vans. I hate them. More than just hating vans, I hate Chrysler vans. <laughs> and you know what we ended up with? A Chrysler van. That's what we have. And these are lighter examples of, of asking, you know, is this the one? But there's a very heavy reality behind this question, too. Sometimes life gets very, very real, and we wonder, you know, is this going to be, is this new job going to be the one that, that helps me to provide better for my family? Uh, is this the day I'm going to get some rest? Is this going to be the big breakthrough that I've been waiting for? Is this going to be the doctor who helps me? Is this going to be the, the, the medicine or the treatment that cures me? Is this the one? Is this going to be the president that turns our country around? Is this new speaker of the house going to get the job done? Is this going to be the year business picks up or the farm turns around? Is this the one that's going to live up to my expectations? Is this going to be the one? And I bring this question up this morning. I, I lay this question before us. This, is this going to be the one? Because I believe that it is our context for Genesis chapter 4. The context is anticipation. And let me explain this. Remember in Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve sinned. God communicated the consequences of their sin. But he also communicated uh, an incredible grace to them. He, he sort of teased this, this plan of redemption in Genesis 3.15, God addressed the serpent, who is Satan, and he says, I will put enmity or a conflict between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Or as the Amplified Bible emphasizes, he shall fatally bruise your head and you shall only bruise his heel. 
So that is what Adam and Eve and the serpent know as we come out of Genesis chapter 3, that someday Eve's offspring will defeat this, this evil one. And we, we, know, we know that to be Jesus, but they don't know that. Adam and Eve are hopeful that they will not have to live in this fallen world for very much longer. They are already expecting the one. And so I want you to keep that in mind as we begin looking at chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. That's where we're going to be today. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. And many of us are very familiar with this story, the story of, of Cain and Abel, Adam and Eve's first two sons. And truth be told, we could approach this text from about a dozen different angles. Uh, I could give a message to you on murder, a message on giving, a message on heart matters, a message on envy, a message on anger, a message on controlling your emotions, a message on wandering, a message on being your brother's keeper, uh, things going from bad to worse, uh, the pervasiveness of sin, even a message of mercy. I could give a message on any of those things, and all of them would probably be right and accurate. They're all there in the text, and, and those things probably will come out in the message today. But I think a big part of the emotion we ought to feel behind this text is found in failed expectations. And again, I say that because Genesis 3.15 sets up a very particular hope. Genesis 4.1 brings the expectation that their hope is becoming a reality. And then we go another chapter forward, Genesis chapter 5, in verse 29, we see that they are still desperate for their hope to be fulfilled. And in case you're not familiar with Genesis 5, it's all genealogy. Sometimes we wonder, why, why is genealogy included in the Bible? Why am I told to study that particular chapter? This, and, and chapter five goes from Adam to Noah, and I guess to Noah's kids as well, uh, but it's all about sons who are born and men who die. That's what the whole chapter is about. Every birth mentioned in this genealogy ends with the refrain, and he died, all except for one, Enoch, and, and we're not covering Enoch today. Uh, but this is the only place in the Bible where that refrain, and he died, appears with such frequency, and it makes this critical point to us that the curse of death that God pronounced in Genesis chapter 3, that he pronounced over humanity, has taken hold, and it hammers through the generations like a drumbeat. And he died, and he died, and he died. Throughout the generations, the Genesis 3 curse prevails. And then you get to, to chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. It says, When Lamech had lived 182 years, he fathered a son and called his name Noah, saying, Out of the ground that the Lord has cursed, and so he has in mind the curse, this one shall bring us relief from our work and from the painful toil of our hands. And so for those generations, we see they've been waiting for this one. And by the way, Lamech was wrong. It's not Noah. Noah is not the person. I mean, God works with Noah here. And, and I, I mean, they get relief from their toil, but not in the way they thought they were going to get it for sure. But the way that this is written, it communicates to us that every generation from Adam to Noah clung to the hope that one of them would be, or at least one of them would have, the offspring that's mentioned in Genesis 3.15. So we should see Adam and Eve's hope to be the same as we enter Genesis chapter 4. There's our context. And now we need to move on to some really, I would call it some very sticky and interpretive work with verse 1. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. The text says, now Adam knew his wife, Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. Seems simple enough, but all in all, all in all, this is one of the worst verses in the Bible to translate accurately. Oddly enough, we could view this verse in a very favorable way that Eve is announcing that she has gotten this child because God has helped her get this child. It seems as though this is indeed a shout of praise. By all means, nearly every single Bible translation that you read makes it seem that way, at least at first glance, until we start to study that Hebrew language and we start to study the sentence structure. And I think it's just a little bit more difficult than, than, than what we see on paper. It's kind of like, you know, do you ever get a, a, a text message or an email and you read it and you realize you can read this one of two 
ways, but you don't really know the tone behind it. I mean, this could be good, this could be bad, but you get no sense of what the tone is. That's kind of what we have right here in chapter 4, verse 1. Eve's words here are either a shout of praise or they are a sign of pride. And let me explain this. The words with the help of, what we have in English, do not appear in the original Hebrew text. Some translators believe that they are, they are implied in the text, but they don't actually appear. There is one preposition that's in here, the Hebrew word eth, which can mean it can mean with, it can mean from, it can mean of, it can mean by, into, out of, against, together, among, or beside. There are a lot of meaning, meanings for this one word, and it's hard to know which it is. It's kind of a catch-all word here. And if the preposition here means with, then Eve is saying, I have gotten a man with God. That's how it would read. Could easily be translated with the help of God. But that's only if this particular word means with. And I think that we need to look at the rest of the sentence. Many, many biblical scholars would say that Eve is actually being self-aggrandizing here. The literal Hebrew to English would say, I have acquired or I have created, I have done this. And Eve oddly says that she has acquired or created a man. The Hebrew word is ish, man. Not baby, not child, not baby boy, but man. And nowhere else in scripture is, is, is the Hebrew word ish used for, for baby. It's always for man. And so we, we see that Eve sticks with this language. I have created or I have acquired a man. And two of the world's foremost Genesis scholars say that Eve's remark is a shout of triumph, not to God, not magnifying God for his help here, but putting herself on par with God as creator. I have created a man equally with the Lord is, is then how this would read. So we either have a shout of praise or we have a sign of pride here in Genesis 4.1. It's, it's either I have gained a man with the help of the Lord or it's I have created a man as the Lord has done. And I'm not sure there could be any greater chasm of interpretive difference here. But I favor the second interpretation. And the biggest reason is because I think we see a change in Eve throughout chapter 4. Uh, by the end of the chapter, we see the birth of Seth. And Eve does not say, I have gotten or acquired or created a man. Instead, she says, God has appointed for me another offspring. And this is where I think we begin to determine the tone behind the text in both of these places. There's a different verb used. Instead of I acquired, it's God appointed for me. I think the events of chapter four humbled Eve where, I, in, in my opinion, she probably started a little bit prideful and self-magnifying. She ends up humble in recognizing God's provision. And I think that original heart attitude maybe is important for us to, to know as we jump in to the text and see maybe some of the same things in her firstborn, Cain. So now that I've spent half the sermon on verse 1, let's look at the other 15 verses, shall we? We're going to look at the rest of the text as though we're answering this big question, is Cain the one who's going to fulfill the plan of God? And the answer, of course, we know is no, he isn't. But let's see exactly why the answer is no. And I'm going to break the rest of the text up into three sections. The first one we'll call sin of the heart. Let's look again at the good word, Cain is born, Eve seems excited about it. Verse two, Abel is born, and we get no such exclamation from her. And then we see their professions. Abe was a, or a, Abe. Abel uh, was a keeper of sheep, so he was a shepherd, and Cain was a worker of the ground. He was a tiller of the ground. You could say he's a farmer. He was like his dad, basically. So we have a shepherd of the sheep, we have a tiller of the ground, and we head into verse three, which is where things get, uh, where things get busy. Verse 3 starts this way. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. So this is where we get our very first whiff of an issue with Cain here, where we see this, this, this guy has some, some major heart issues. And there are several, but I'm only going to cover two this morning. First, we see that Cain has a heart of tokenism. 
Cain has a heart of tokenism. And what I mean by that is that he's practicing something in the text in a very perfunctory, very routine, very mechanical way. We see it in his offering. God had no regard for Cain and his offering. He did not accept it. He gave Cain and his offering no consideration whatsoever. And the question that we have to ask is why? Why is that? And some say it is because Abel's offering was a, a blood sacrifice, so intrinsically it has more value, it's more meaningful, but I don't think that that's the reason because we see later on in Scripture, we see in the Mosaic Covenant that grain offerings, fruit offerings, they are on par with, with blood offerings. All are acceptable to the Lord in the Mosaic Covenant. So what is it that brought the Lord's favor upon Abel but not upon Cain? And we only get hints of an answer in Genesis 4. We see it in the language. Abel brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And fat portions is an important term here. It represents the very best. Leviticus 3.16 says, all fat belongs to the Lord. (laughs) Cammie printed that on a on a shirt for me. It's supposed to make me feel better about myself. (laughs) Year after year, there seems to be more of me to offer to God. So Abel was giving the firstborn and the fat portions to God. He was giving the, the most important. Abel was giving what is most costly, most costly, the best of the best of his occupation. Cain, on the other hand, brought an offering to the Lord of the fruits of the ground, as all were told. It does not say that Cain brought the first fruits of the ground, just fruits. So it would seem that Cain, as an expression of his heart, is choosing not to give God the best of his occupation, but rather just some, maybe what's left over. It's, it's, he's giving out of this mere tokenism, going through the motions, probably even holding back for himself what is most valuable. And that's perhaps what we can conclude from the language in Genesis 4, but how about we look at an inspired answer also in Hebrews chapter 11. It says, By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. So by faith, Abel brought God his offering. So what made that offering more acceptable to God? What was it that brought the Lord's favor upon Abel? It was Abel's bringing of an offering by his faith, not mere mechanical obedience. By faith, Abel gave God the best and essentially lived on the rest. And church, I want you to consider this for just a moment this morning. Consider your own giving habits, that this is not a a sermon on tithes and offerings, but it is a part of the text. We can't ignore that. It does speak to us. Something ought to be given, and God is not impressed with our token giving. He's not impressed with tokenism at all. We ought to come to God with our best in faith. Or how about this? Giving is a form of worship. Let's, let's talk about worship as a whole. Do, do you come to church out of mere obligation? Are you here on Sunday mornings because you're obligated to, or are you here to offer your true and best worship to a worthy God? Some people come to church because they think it will cover up their week. And I don't know, I can't remember the name of this pastor. I remember hearing once, a weekend of worship does not wash away a week of wickedness. The truth is God sees you. He sees you. He sees through you. He knows your heart. He sees your heart. And he sees Cain has a heart of tokenism. He also sees Cain has a heart of anger. So Cain was very angry, is what the text says, and his face fell. His face was downcast. He was noticeably angry. And so what does God do? Well, first he questions Cain. Why are you angry and why has your face fallen? And again, God knows the answer. Just like when God was asking the questions of Adam and Eve in in chapter 3, he knows the answer, but he asks anyway in order to get Cain to focus in on his heart issue here. 
So God questions Cain and then God exhorts Cain. If you do well, he says, will you not be accepted? If you do well, in other words, do well, Cain. If you want me to accept your offering, if you want me to accept your worship, do well, do what is right. He says, I will accept your sacrifice when it is rightly offered. Get your heart right. And then God offers a warning. He says, and if you do not do well, if you do not get your heart right, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. More than a warning, I think that maybe this is a very gracious rebuke. Do well, and you'll be accepted, but if you don't, sin is crouching Sin is crouching at your door. And we don't like that very much. As human beings, we are not a, a big fan of being on the receiving end of a statement like that. Um, I've had to have conversations like this. People have had to have conversations with me like this. You know, hey, hey what you're doing, right? The way that you're going, the path that you're on, it's not going to end well for you. I remember, it's probably been three or four years ago now, it was Christmas Eve and I got asked to, uh, to go to the jail here in town and visit a young man who was on a bad path. And I had had a, a few conversations with him prior to this, but uh, I went, I went to the jail. I spent about a half hour in his jail cell with him. And we looked around and I just asked him, do you like where you are right now? And his answer, of course, is no. So I asked, do you know how you got here? He says, yes. I said, do you want to make a lifestyle of it? And again, his answer is no. Okay, then you've got to make some changes. You've got to get some course correction going here. And that's what God is doing for Cain right now. It's this loving rebuke. Cain, be careful. Cain, watch yourself. Make a change because the decisions you're making right now will not end well for you. And parents, parents, if you're anything like me, you play this card all the time with your kids. You try to get them to look at the path that they're on and where it ends. And how often do your kids like it? If they're anything like mine, they don't like it. They hate it. Amen. They hate this conversation. But it's important. Cain has a heart of anger. And you know what happens when you have a heart of anger and you're not willing to check yourself? It spills out. It spills out. That leads us into the next point, sin of the hands. Is Cain the one who will fulfill God's plan? No, because of the sin of his heart. And now no, because of the sin of his hands. Cain did not heed God's words. God said, you must rule over it. And the truth is, if we do not rule over our sin, and, and specifically here, what's being mentioned by God is a, a sinful emotion, specifically this anger, then it must stand. If we're not going to rule over it, it's going to rule over us. It's going to control us. It's going to devour us is the warning. It, it's crouching at the door, waiting for you to open that door so that it will devour you. Peter picks up on this language and he says, be watchful. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. This is not a, a cuddly animal. This is not something you want to try to nurture by any means. It's going to devour you. Do not open the door to sin. Do not go out and check on it. Do not try to, to, to have a conversation with it like Eve did. Keep the door closed. Shut the door on your sin. Don't let it in is God's purpose with Cain here. God was exposing Cain's heart and he was warning him about what his anger could easily turn into and how we respond. How we respond when, when we are exposed reveals, I think, the real us. And look at the real Cain, boiling with anger and hatred. Verse 8 says, Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Cain is a murderer with his own hands, in his own field, on the very ground that he works, he kills his own brother. And though uh, Abel is ultimately the victim of, of Cain's anger here. He's the one who paid the price for finding favor with God and for doing things with a, a right and worshipful heart. I really do not think that it was Abel whom Cain was after here. I mean, yes, he, he 
planned this out and he lured Abel into the field. Yes, he rose up against him and spilled his blood. Yes, he, he, he was likely envious of Abel. Yes, he hated Abel, according to 1 John. Yes, he meant to kill him, but I truly believe Cain was angry with God and Abel was, was the direction that Cain's anger flowed. It's kind of like, uh, you know, you have a bad day at work and you come home and you realize you're snapping at your family, right? They didn't do anything. They didn't do anything wrong, but that's just the direction your anger is flowing. And this crime, in an earthly way of speaking, may have been a crime against Abel, but more than that, this is a crime against God. Taking the life of another is a direct crime against the creator of that life, Isn't that why David, King David, repents and he says, against you, God, and you only have I sinned after he slept with Bathsheba and and has her husband murdered. Proverbs 19 says, when a man's folly brings his way to ruin, his heart rages against the Lord. Cain's perfunctory giving was his folly. His half-hearted worship was his folly. His anger was his folly. It has led him to ruin, and so he rages. And church, I have to ask, does it frighten you even just a little bit? Does it frighten you at all that Cain went from anger to murder like that? Like that? Amen. Do you see why Jesus connects anger and murder in Matthew chapter 5? I think it's moral short-sightedness to think that sinful anger is really not a big deal and it's not something we really have to work on or rule over. Cain certainly couldn't go after God, so he went after God's image. He raged against the Lord by raging against his image bearer. And now do you see how Genesis 3.15 is actually coming to fruition here and not in the way that, that Eve had hoped for? I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. There will be conflict between the wicked and between the righteous. Cain showed himself to be a son of the devil by his wickedness, and he hated Abel for his righteousness. That's what 1 John chapter 3 says. Cain hated Abel because his deeds were righteous and Cain's were wicked. So Cain, the offspring of Satan, evidenced by his own wickedness, made conflict with the one who was favored by God in the text. And I want you to consider that in the grand scheme, the hostility of the wicked against the righteous started with Cain and Abel, brothers. And so here's God's response. Verse 9, then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? And of course, again, God knows. He knows. It's a lot like chapter 3 when God asked Cain's dad, where are you? He knows. And Cain's response is, is fairly typical of an angry little man. Cain, where is your brother? I don't know. I don't know, he says. So he flat out lies. He flat out lies. And then he says, am I my brother's keeper? He's mouthing off to God at this point. Am I my brother's keeper? Remember that Abel was a keeper of the sheep? Keeper, that that same word used to describe Abel as a shepherd is is used by Cain right here. And I think think Cain just thinks he's clever. Like there's this insolent witticism here. We could see this as, am I the shepherd's shepherd? Sheep needed an eye on them at all times. So Cain is saying to God, you expect me to watch him 24 seven? You expect me to keep my eye on him all the time? He's exaggerating God's expectations in order to deny his responsibility to love and to look after his own brother. And that's not an acceptable way to answer. I mean, what a stupid way to talk to God, number one, but also what a stupid answer. Am I my brother's keeper? Yes, you are. Yes, you are your brother's keeper. I mean, aren't we all to look out for the good and the well-being of our brothers and sisters? First John, again, we'll go to First John, says that we should love one another and connecting that John writes, we should not be like Cain, who is of the evil one and murdered his brother. No, love and look out for him. So God answers back, what have you done? Again, God knows, and and this again parallels the conversation between Adam and Eve and and God in chapter 3. He says, the voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. God is saying, I know what you've done. 
I know what you've done. I know you killed Abel. It cannot be hidden from me. Confess it and take responsibility for what you've done. And I love um, what John Calvin says here. He basically, this is paraphrasing, but he says something along the lines of, it is a wonderfully sweet consolation to good men when they, are un- when they unjustly suffer, that their sufferings go into the presence of God of their own accord and demand vengeance. That is the voice of Abel's blood. That is what it cries out. It cries out to God for vengeance. We see that again and again in the Old Testament, blood spilled that cries out for vengeance. And this leads us into our last section, judgment from heaven. Judgment from heaven. And I'll try to keep this one a little bit shorter. Because of Cain's actions, God curses him. And this is the first curse to be placed on a human being. The text says, And now you are cursed from the ground which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. So we're going to stop there for a moment. The punishment, honestly, if you think about it, it fits the crime here. Cain, a farmer, a worker of the ground, spills his brother's blood, my goodness, on the ground. And now the ground will no longer produce for him. Its yield will be minimal. As the blood of Abel polluted the ground, so the curse arises from the ground to convict Cain. And because Cain killed a member of his own family, Cain will be driven from his family. Being driven away from the land, becoming a wanderer, becoming a fugitive, implies that Cain is being driven from his relationships as well as his relationship to God. Here's how we can see this. Cain will never be at home. Cain will never be at home. Think on that. Imagine never being at home, never going home again. So Cain says, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you have driven me today away from the ground and from your face face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth and whoever finds me will kill me. So Cain laments, he's paraphrasing God's punishment on him, reflecting on it, and he's also adding his own fear, which is likely where his greatest concern lies. Whoever finds me will kill me. And this statement, this this one little statement here has baffled scholars for thousands of years. Who else is there, right? Who else is on the earth at this time? Who is out there to kill him? Because four people have been mentioned so far in scripture, only four, Adam, Eve, Cain, Abel, Abel is now gone, so there there are only two other people that could go out and kill Cain, his parents. So who is it that he's referring to here? I have a really good buddy uh, from the church I used to serve at, and he's dead serious, but he believes that this is definitely referring to aliens. (laughs) Anytime there's something difficult uh, to understand in Scripture, that's always his answer. It's probably aliens. He says it's all over in scripture. We ought to know. Um, I have always favored the idea that maybe, maybe Cain is referring to fallen angels. Uh, If you think about it, the, the, the angels that followed Satan, when they were cast out of heaven, they were not cast into hell. They were hurled down to the earth. And so they're here, they're on the earth. So maybe he's referring to them. But I also think Cain could be talking about future generations, I want you to think about this. Cain is familiar with Genesis 3.15, the prophecy of the snake crusher. And he knows that this snake crusher, he knows it's not Adam because Adam is not the offspring of the woman. He knows it can't be Abel because he killed Abel and he knows it cannot be himself. And so he must come to this conclusion that there will be future generations. Somebody has to step into that role. More people have to be Born, and there must be more generations to come. So maybe he may be concerned about future generations who will rise up and maybe know what he's done and hunt him down to avenge Abel. But I guess it, it probably, in the grand scheme of things, probably doesn't matter who it is that he's talking about. I think what matters most is that God answers his fear with undeserved mercy. Is Cain the one who will fulfill God's plan, a plan that brings relief and brings mercy? No, because Cain himself is in need of God's mercy. 
Cain says, whoever finds me will kill me, and God responds, not so. If anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, lest any who found him should attack him. And then Cain went away from the, from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. And we don't know what the mark is either, just so you know. Some people would say it's a tattoo. Uh, some scholars believe maybe a hairstyle. Uh, one, there's one very notable scholar who says God appointed a dog to Cain, and that dog was going to protect him from intruders. That was the mark of Cain. But whatever it was, it served two purposes. One, to protect Cain when he does not deserve protecting, and two, as a reminder. This mark protected Cain, and it reminded him either of the curse or of God's mercy, or maybe both. And he settled east of Eden. East seems to be the direction of judgment and separation, the direction away from God. When Adam and Eve were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, they went east, east away from the Lord. Cain here is going further east, further away from the Lord. There's great separation due to their unholiness. I listen to a lot of uh, Pastor Kevin DeYoung, and, and right now he's going through the book of Leviticus with his congregation. And as I listen to that series, almost every single sermon he preaches, he asks this question, how can an unholy people live in the midst of a holy God? I mean, look at this separation that's happening. More and more sin, more and more separation. How can an unholy people live in the midst of a holy God? And he makes the point that everyone that we encounter is living somewhere east of Eden. And so how do we get home is the question. Cain doesn't get to go home. How do we get home? Well, we listen to another voice, don't we? I want to make a connection before I let you go today. Genesis 4 tells us that the voice of Abel's blood cried out to God. Hebrews 12 tells us of another voice from another blood. But you have come... But you have come to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. And this is the blood of Christ, Amen. the one who fulfilled the, God, the, the plan of God. His blood speaks a better word. And the next verse, verse 25, would say, See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. You see, that's our way home, to follow that voice. It's crazy to me, the, the parallels between Abel and Jesus. Abel's blood speaks from the ground of God's vengeance. Christ's blood speaks from the cross of God's forgiveness. Amen. Amen. Abel was a shepherd. Christ is a better shepherd, the good shepherd. And his sheep know his voice. To all who are living east of Eden, follow the good shepherd's voice. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you this morning, snow and cold and all. We are thankful to be able to gather as your children to worship and fellowship and to grow. And Lord, I just want to thank you for your mercy. Like the song we're about to sing says, morning by morning, new mercies I see. We're much like Cain in that we do, not, we do not deserve mercy from you. We do not deserve your loving kindness. Many of us harbor at times sinful attitudes or practice mechanical habits of worship, half-hearted and, and many times distracted. Lord, help us to keep watch and to rule over our sin. Gather us together to bring to you true and pleasing worship. And more than anything, we thank you this morning, Lord, for the one who fulfills your plan, Jesus Christ, whose blood shed for us speaks the word of forgiveness and of peace, that we may have peace with you. We, may we live in that forgiveness, may we rest in that peace, and may we hope in Christ's imminent return. And it's in your name that we do pray. Amen.